The Asus ROG Ally is just a little over two years old, and when it first came out, there were definitely some issues, software problems, as well as some overheating issues. But with a couple of few easy mods, you can improve this little guy and get, honestly, one of the best bang for your buck experiences that you can in any mobile handheld to date. By the end of this video, you'll know a couple of tips and tricks to get things just right on your Asus ROG Ally. And if there's something that I don't mention, let me know down in in the comments below. Other people are going to read things down there. Now, despite this handheld being just over two years old, it's still a champ. You can find this in the used marketplace for around $300 to $350, but even at Best Buy's open box, you can find that for just over $380. And that just packs so much value into such a small form factor. You're still able to play plenty of modern AAA titles. It might chug from time to time, but for the most part, things run relatively well now that this handheld has matured. One thing that I do want to go ahead and mention is that the Asus ROG Ally X was released roughly a year after the ROG Ally, and Asus took the feedback from plenty of the users and content creators like myself and implemented things based on that feedback into the Asus ROG Ally X. Now, regardless of that, the price difference between the Asus ROG Ally and the Ally X is honestly quite a bit, especially when you can find this handheld online, used $350-ish, and the Asus ROG Ally X, even used, is looking at around $750, so it's pretty expensive. Now, even with all of the mods that I talk about in this video, you're still going to not even get close to the Asus ROG Ally X price point. No matter what your setup's like at home, you wanna make sure that you have a future-proof setup with the fastest cables possible. This is where Silkland, today's sponsor, comes comes into play. With their latest VESA certified DisplayPort 2.1 cables, this is their model S1334, and you can get up to 80 gigabits per second. That means that you can get up to 8K at 240 hertz, 4K at 540 hertz, and you can even get up to 16K. With its DP80 compatibility, you can use this for UHBR20, you can use this for HDR10+, 3D content, and even HDCP 2.3. With varying lengths ranging from 1.6 feet all the way up to 16.5 feet, you can find the perfect length for your setup. Long story short, these cables will future-proof your setup, and they're ridiculously strong to boot. If you're ready to upgrade and future-proof your setup today, then follow the link in the description below. And thanks to Silkland for sponsoring this video. Now, as a new Ally user, I would recommend just upgrading the internal storage. The micro SD card that's there, even though it, technically the warranty was extended to prevent any sort of issues that are happening and allowing for free repairs for, from Asus, I just, I don't really trust it even now. So the internal storage is the way to go in terms of storing all of your games. At 512 gigabytes, it just isn't enough to actually get all of the games that I would want on a handheld while I'm playing, while I'm out and about, and I'm disconnected from the internet or Wi-Fi or whatever it may be. So I would rather have, you know, just double the storage. Even if it's one terabyte, you're going to get much more space and breathing room to install the games that you want to go ahead and have on here. Now, the thing with 2230 SSDs, the small ones like the ones that's installed in here, is that you're limited to a two terabyte maximum at the time of this recording. In order to get around that, I would recommend spending two, three, four dollars to get an M.2 adapter. Now, what this does is that it allows you to install a 2280 SSD onto your ROG Ally. And the cool thing with this is that not only does it increase the amount of space that you can have because 2280 SSDs are just bigger in terms of capacity, but it also allows you to save money. 2280 SSDs, because they're much more widely available, are less expensive than the 2230 counterparts. That means that you're going to save money and you're going to spend less money per gigabyte on SSDs. So this will save you money. A one terabyte at 2230 SSD is roughly around $90 at the time of this recording, whereas a one terabyte 2280 is roughly around $75. It's not a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it definitely helps in terms of budgeting and pricing comparison. 
When you're ready to swap out the SSD in your Ally, all you have to do is just flip it over and then unscrew the six screws that are there. If you're using a third-party backplate already, then all six screws should be loose. If you're using the original OEM one that came with the Ally, then that bottom center screw is going to stay attached to that backplate. Once you remove that, I do recommend actually uh, unlatching and disconnecting the battery that is there just to prevent anything from shorting out. Uh, after that, you can remove the plastic cover that's there, and from there, you can install the SSD just swap it out, unscrew the original one that's there and put in the new one. If you're using an adapter, go ahead and put that in. And then after that, you can put your M.2 2280 SSD and replace it like so. After that, all you gotta do is do everything in reverse, close it back up and you should be set and ready to go. After you install your SSD, whether you're using a 2230 or you're using the adapter to use a 2280, you wanna make sure that you actually plug in a power adapter into your Ally. If not, it won't actually boot up. And when you actually do boot it up, you should be greeted by the BIOS menu. Now I'm gonna access this here because I already have everything installed, but you hold the power button and once you actually see this right here, you push down on the volume rocker and you're going to be greeted with the BIOS menu. Now, when you're in your BIOS menu, you want to push Y and then from there, you're going to go into advance. So Y and then advance. And then this top option that's right here is Asus Cloud Recovery. If you were to hit that, it'll uh, pretty much go into Asus servers and pull down your copy of Windows alongside with Armory Crate and a bunch of other things that are needed in order to get this back up to how it was before. From there, it it'll just work like a regular computer. It takes roughly around 30 minutes to get everything set up, but honestly, if you're getting a new SSD and you're installing this, it's just very easy to install and get everything back up and running to how it was before you installed or swapped over your SSD. Admittedly, I don't actually use an adapter in my Asus ROG Ally because by the time that I even realized that this was a thing, I'd already installed a 2231 terabyte SSD in this thing. And it almost feels like it was kind of like fate because by the time that JSO reached out with their 65 watt hour battery upgrade kit, then it just kind of worked out. In that kit, you also have a backplate and also a heatsink that you can put onto the CPU itself for improved thermals and cooling. If you're using the M.2 adapter, then you won't be able to use that heatsink that it comes with, but even still, you can still use the battery and that backplate that's there. Now, there is a 74 watt hour upgrade kit that you can do as well. It's a little bit more juice than the 65 watt hour one, but you don't get all of the bells and whistles. You don't get the heat sink and you also don't get a backplate included with that. It does come with a little trimming tool that you can use to trim the internals of the backplate that's there. But at the end of the day, it really just depends on whatever you want to go ahead and do. I personally like the JSO one just because it's a one-stop shop. You knock everything out all at the same time and you get better cooling and thermals at the same time. If you were to go the JSO route instead of just getting the 74 watt hour mod, then it does come with that backplate that I mentioned. And when you install the backplate, well, nothing really changes. It's pretty much more or less exactly the same. And uh, that also accounts for the ergonomics, which are not really that comfortable. The ergonomics on the Asus ROG Ally is just really, well, flat, which kind of sucks because I like curves whenever I'm actually playing on something and holding something in my hands. I, I, I want curves in my handhelds. Now, thankfully, there are plenty of options that are out there for either grips or cases or whatever it is that you're looking for. Dbrand is one of the uh, more popular ones and their case is pretty comfortable. I'm not going to lie. Overall, the use of it is pretty, you know, it's, it's there. There are different options that are here. You can get it with a front cover. You can get it with out the front cover. You could also get it with skins depending on what it is that you want to go in and do for your styling. JSO also has uh, their own model. It's, it isn't as expensive. The mod case is, you know, it comes in a full package. Um, the white is kind of, you know, getting discolored a little bit with time, but I feel like that's kind of like normal when it comes to most of these things. If you want to, you can just go with the grips and just kind of have that installed on your Asus ROG Ally. And that's kind of, you know, a nice uh, workaround where you can kind of have a little bit more of a comfortable grip without, you know, having to worry about a big bulky case that's protecting the entirety of your handheld whenever you're out and about. Let's say you, that you don't want to game out and about and you just want to play at home comfortably. Obviously, you can connect this to a power outlet and, you know, lounge on the couch or in bed or whatever it may be. But you might want to also connect this to a television. There are plenty of dock options that are out there. I have one from Ivanki is literally sitting right in front of me, but there are other ones. 
iVolar, JSO, Ugreen, and so on and so forth. Now you can connect this to a TV, but you wanna make sure that the dock that you do get has a power supply that goes to this handheld that is at least 65 watts. The CPU and GPU that's in here needs at least 65 watts to run well. That being said, even though you can connect this to a TV, the performance might wane depending on whether or not you're playing a graphically intensive title and you're rendering above 1080p. If you're looking at just rendering and showing on a 4K monitor your 1080p image, yeah, it might look a little bit blurry at times, but overall, the experience that you're going to get is pretty good. Now, one of the downfalls with the Asus ROG Ally is that you don't have any sort of third-party support for eGPUs. You have to use their proprietary XG Mobile eGPU in order to have some form of eGPU functionality. And what that means is that you can't go to the store and just buy any external GPU and just connect it to this and it'll work because that's just not the case. You have to use Asus's own thing. I've never been a fan of that and that's probably what most people think because when the Ally X came out, it they just scrapped that whole XG mobile port and decided to go with Thunderbolt 4. That's enough about the hardware. Let's talk about some software upgrades that you can do on this handheld. I've been a fan of Steam OS and Bazite OS since I got into this whole PC handheld space. The first PC handheld that I did get was a Steam Deck, and that just kind of, well, set my mindset in terms of what I want from my PC handheld experience. Now, that's not to say that Windows isn't a good experience at all. It's actually really great. And the front ends that are available to us from Lenovo, from Asus, and so on and so forth are amazing. Armory Crate has matured to such a great front end software that it almost feels like you're playing on its own well, OS, so to speak. Now, if you do want to go ahead and install SteamOS, you can go to Steam's website right now. I see that SteamOS 3.7.13 is the latest one, as far as I can tell. And that was released on June 30th. That's the stable build. If you want to go with a beta client, then obviously that's different, but I digress. Installing on this is very easy to do. You literally download it, flash it onto a uh, USB stick, and then install that onto your handheld. It will wipe the drive and so on and so forth. But what I ended up doing is after it wiped the drive, I created a, a two additional partitions. One partition was for Windows OS, and then the third partition was for games to be shared across OSs. I didn't think that it would make sense to divide your uh, hard drive by two and then have some games that are installed on both sides of the hard drive. So instead, both OSs share that game hard drive space. But I'll be posting a video about how to do this really, really soon. The last time that I talked about this in a video, people were really excited about it, but I had to travel and so on and so forth. But I digress, it will be coming soon. So subscribe, that way you're notified when I actually do release a video talking about that specifically. One other thing that I wanna go ahead and say is that Steam OS or Bazite OS and Linux overall has matured to the point where you can use plenty of features that were exclusive to Windows in Steam OS or Linux. For example, lossless scaling at this point, I'm working on a video on that as well, which honestly blew my mind in terms of how it was implemented. Now, lossless scaling as a whole is not implemented in Steam OS or Bazite OS, but the frame generation capabilities from that application are installed on here as well. And it is relatively easy to do. But once I'm done with that video, I'll link that up here. That way you can go ahead and check that out. But when it comes down to it, it just makes Makes, it breathes life into all these handhelds that are there. And because the frame generation isn't too crazy, the latency isn't that bad. Obviously, if you're playing a fighting game or if you're playing something that requires you to have, you know, very, very, very tight windows for parries or whatever it may be, then yeah. The, you will feel that. But for the most part, if you're playing a single player game, you're not going to feel the latency that is there from the frame generation that comes into play. Obviously, loss of scaling has been on the Windows side of things because that's where it was, you know, well created and where it's maintained. But on the Steam OS and the Bazite OS side of things, you can also use a Decky Frame Gen via Decky Loader. And what the Frame Gen mod does is it is allows you to use OptiScaler to essentially uh, trigger a DLSS setting. But what that really really is, is FSR 3.1 or XCSS 2.0, depending on the game, via DirectX 12. 
Long story short, what that means is that you're going to get a better overall image and better overall performance. FSR 2.0, as we all know, is not the most beautiful when it comes to upscaling games, especially when you go down into performance mode. But here with this, it allows for much more visual fidelity and it's not really costing too much in terms of performance. Just the better overall experience is using Decky Frame Gen. It's just honestly awesome and beautiful in terms of what it can do. I'll have links to all of this stuff down in the description below as well as the pinned comment. But if you want to see how I installed that battery mod onto the Ally, then click this video over here. And if you want to see my comparison between Windows and Steam OS, then click this video over here. And until next time, guys, I will see you on the next one. Peace.